my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Julie Saba. Uh, Dr. Saba has both an MD and a PhD, is a pediatric oncologist, and is the professor of pediatrics at UCSF and holds the John and Edna Beck chair of cancer research. Uh, currently, her focus is on this ultra rare disease that affects children. It's splits or sphingosine phosphate lyase insufficiency syndrome. And it's been my great pleasure interacting with her over Catalyst. And we both discovered that we are both published poets. So take it away, Julie. And it follows nicely with Tina's talk because of the gene therapy and the AAV platform. So Julie, it's yours. Thank you so much, Rupa, for the kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for uh, allowing me to share my work today in this symposium. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I am going to share my slides. I'm going to be talking about an enzyme you've probably never heard about called sphingosine phosphate lyase. And I'll be talking about uh, call it different names, the lyase, S1P lyase, and SPL, but it's all the same thing. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking about the gene discovery, um, the gene encoding this enzyme, um, all the way to uh, our ongoing efforts to develop gene therapy for a rare disease called SPLIS uh, that is um, caused by mutations in the human gene encoding this enzyme. Uh, this work was pioneered by uh, a wonderful scientist named Piming Zhao. Uh, Piming was a former postdoctoral fellow in my lab. He's now moved on to China where he's co-founded a company, a new company focused on gene therapy uh, for rare diseases. And I'm very proud of him. He conducted his work um, with the help of a very talented veterinarian named Gazachu Tasu, who is still part of our group. And I'm also gonna be sharing some information about a patient with Spliss uh, that um, was brought to my attention by Dr. Edisham Khalid, whose presentation will follow mine. Um, but I wanna just mention that um, this work is inspired and um, made purposeful um, by uh, individuals with this disease, Bliss. And uh, I'm showing a picture of a young man named Chase who uh, has this condition. Uh, and he inspires me every day, uh, despite the kind of obstacles that he faces day to day in his life with contractures of his hands and being in a wheelchair. Um, he nonetheless has an incredible optimistic attitude um, and, and really um, is in uh, top of mind as I do my work. I have one disclosure to mention. And um, I thought that I would share a little bit about my own personal career journey, uh, because this is really the opposite of where I thought I would be in my life. This is a picture of me uh, in my laboratory uh, as I started my independent career at Children's Hospital Oakland, which is now part of UCSF. Uh, I'm 36 years old here. Um, after many years of education, I'm starting my career surrounded by at test tubes and bottles filled with noxious materials and um, doing yeast genetics, a place that I never thought I would be. And there's a little backstory there. The reason that I never thought that I would be a scientist is I knew science fairly well. Um, I had a father who had an MD, PhD, and actually surprisingly or coincidentally was studying uh, rare diseases of muscle, skeletal muscle. Um, and my dad, this is a picture of my dad surrounded by the, the, the tools and the instruments that he loved to operate in his lab. Uh, and I was encouraged by my father to spend time in his lab in the summers to learn a little bit about science, um, both to inspire me and, uh, and to give me a skill that I could use uh, in summer jobs to help pay for school. Um, but my dad's lab was built during the Cold War. It was built uh, during in and it is in the really the heart of Washington D.C. and it was built to withstand a direct nuclear hit, um, kind of reminiscent of days to, that we're dealing with right now. Um, but this building had no windows; it was made of concrete, and it was very oppressive. And there were smells and sounds that really did not call me to the field of science. Uh, and despite my dad's passion for his work um, and his 
efforts to inspire me into research, um, I was not um, enthralled by the field of science. Um, I did, however, want to become a physician. I, I had the idea of um, being a physician and, and helping people. And I went to medical school and I actually intended to spend my career working on a Navajo reservation where I had spent time as a medical student. It's interesting that this was this topic was brought up earlier today. Uh, and that was my plan. And I uh, started my residency at Duke and um, that was my intention until accidentally I fell in love with little girls and little boys like this with bald heads, little children who were fighting leukemia and, and other forms of cancer. And I decided I uh, just, just, it was a very amazing field. It was changing rapidly because of understanding the genetics of, of the disease and uh, offering of new treatments uh, that came, became possible through clinical trials. Um, but I still didn't want to work in a laboratory, which is part of oncology training, uh, until, uh, until I experienced the death of several of my patients. And at that point, I had an epiphany that um, made me understand something that probably most everybody else knew at the time, which is that until we understood the genetic underpinnings of every child's cancer, we would not be able to offer personalized treatment uh, that is safe and effective for every child with cancer. And upon that realization, I realized that I needed to do research and I needed to be in a laboratory and I needed to get a PhD to equip me for a life in research to understand the genetics of cancer. So this is a picture of me uh, in my laboratory um, as I was getting started. Uh, and I'm actually showing cancer cells to a famous uh, actress, Juliette Binoche, who visited my laboratory some years ago. Now I uh, was looking for new pathways that could be involved in cancer. And I uh, decided to study a family of lipids called sphingolipids. They're an obscure family of lipids, but they control cell growth. And I theorized that these lipids might be involved in cancer. And um, because many of the genes that control cell growth are uh, highly conserved in humans and mice and organisms as simple as yeast, I decided to use a yeast genetic approach to identify genes in this pathway with the theory that genes controlling these lipids could be involved in cancer as well. And I won't go into the details of this strategy, but I ended up using a yeast genetic approach to identify a gene in the pathway. And that gene was sphingosine phosphate lyase, the enzyme I'm gonna tell you about today. And I identified the yeast gene. And from that, I was able to find the gene, the similar gene from fruit flies and C. elegans worms, mouse, and eventually the gene in man, which is called SGPL1. And I'm not gonna go into biochemical details. I just want to show you that this is the pathway that I was interested in. And the enzyme uh, whose gene I identified, SGPL1, sits at the very bottom of this pathway. And using yeast genetics, I cloned that first gene. And then the beauty of yeast genetics is that you can use that mutation or that mutant enzyme, uh, that mutant strain to identify other genes in the pathway. And so very quickly, the whole pathway was uh, opened up to genetic manipulation. And it turns out that these lipids and the genes that, um, uh, that, um, that are encoding the enzymes that control their, their metabolism are involved in a whole family of rare diseases. Uh, they're also involved in cancer, but they're also responsible for a variety of rare diseases that we're now beginning to study. So I focused on this enzyme S1P lyase and I studied it in many different model organisms. And over the years, we became uh, um, knowledgeable about its role in human development in well, animal development and muscle function and neurologic function and various other uh, uh, conditions. Um, and over the years, uh, some uh, other people in our field contributed to the study uh, and understanding of this enzyme. The crystal structure of the protein was determined and it was found to be a homodimer, two different copies of the same 
gene uh, make two subunits that come together to form the enzyme. A knockout mouse was generated that doesn't have the enzyme activity. And this mouse only lives for three weeks, demonstrating the critical nature of this enzyme in survival. And then uh, uh, more astonishingly in 2017, um, we were involved in the discovery of a rare disease caused by mutations, inactivating mutations in the human gene, SGPL1. Um, now two different groups uh, arrived at the same discovery at the same time using both, both of us using next generation sequencing of um, a, a kindred uh, families um, in which one or more uh, children were affected by this disorder. And what was discovered is that it was inactivating mutations in this gene, SGPL1, that tracked with the patients who had the disease. All the children who had the disease had the mutations and all of the family members who were healthy did not have the mutations. And so this gene and the disease was discovered. And um, this disease is called, now we've named it SPL, insufficiency syndrome or SPLIS. And it's caused by a whole variety of different mutations in the, the gene encoding this enzyme. Uh, the mutations fall all along the different uh, parts of the, of the protein, um, but they all cause inactivation. So what are the features of the disease? Um, almost all of the patients have lymphopenia, which means that the lymphocytes that are part of our immune system are not circulating in the bloodstream. And the reason for that is that the substrate of the enzyme, that uh, the function of the enzyme is to break down a molecule called S1P. And that molecule uh, is a signaling molecule that is required for lymphocytes to come out of the lymph nodes. And so when the enzyme isn't working, the S1P builds up, it causes abnormal signals and the lymphocytes get trapped in the lymph nodes. This often doesn't cause a lot of problems for the patient, but it can. Um, most of the patients also have something called steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. And this occurs when the kidney fails to do its one of its main functions, which is to filter the blood, to let small proteins spill out into the urine, but to hold on to uh, large proteins such as albumins and uh, albumin and immunoglobulins, antibodies, clotting factors, and various other proteins needs to hold on to, um, to do its work. And um, this is a very serious problem. And in SPLIS children, um, this can lead to kidney failure. Um, the, the high molecular weight proteins just damage the kidney um, as on their way out. And um, this is a rapidly progressive disease that uh, leads to end stage kidney disease and requiring kidney transplant or um, dialysis um, for survival. Many of the children also have adrenal insufficiency and that's when their adrenal gland doesn't make the hormones that it's supposed to make. One of these being cortisol, our stress hormone that helps us deal with infections and um, other, other stressful conditions. Some of the children have neurologic defects and I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment. And they can have skin manifestations, including ichthyosis, which is a thickening of the skin and um, uh, uh, acanthosis or, or darkening spots in the skin. And then a number of um, metabolic and, um, and other abnormalities that can be detected in the blood. Importantly, there's no cure for this disease. And uh, the disease was only discovered five years ago we're working very hard on solving that problem, but right now there is no cure. And the outcome, especially in children who present very early in life is, is quite poor. Now, most, most of the focus has been on the kidney disease, but the neurologic aspects of this can be quite debilitating. Children can have cranial nerve defects, which involve um, hearing loss, um, ptosis of the eye, and a peripheral neuropathy. And this neuropathy is an axonopathy. It means that the long processes that lead from the body of the nerve all the way out to the, to the fingers and the toes um, are damaged and, and then the nerve doesn't work. Um, and this is not a demyelinating disorder, but it's an axonopathy. It can involve pain, uh, painful stimuli, painful uh, signals in the nerves, uh, tingling, numbness, and inability to move. The, the hands, which can lead to contractures. 
Uh, this can be measured by nerve conduction study, and we'll see an example of that later. And then some of the patients have a progressive neuropathy, uh, neurodegenerative disease. And um, that's shown by the MRI brain scan on the right. And this is one patient um, with several different views, um, but showing you uh, an increase in white signal, which is very abnormal. And this can be quite progressive and lead to death. Now, one of the main uh, areas of interest in our laboratory that we are focusing on is trying to understand really why these patients have all these symptoms. What is it about SPLIS, about the loss of this enzyme that is causing all of these problems? And uh, we can think about that in, from a biochemical point of view um, uh, in this way. Um, the, the enzyme breaks down the molecule S1P at the very bottom of this pathway. And when the enzyme isn't working, um, S1P can build up and it can cause aberrant signaling in ways that affect inflammation, uh, blood vessel development, lymphocyte trafficking, and many other things. The breakdown of S1P normally produces two products, hexadecinol and ethanolamine phosphate, and these also have important functions. So when the enzyme isn't working, there is a loss of the products. And then uh, because this enzyme guards the only exit point of this pathway, uh, there's a traffic jam when the enzyme doesn't work and you get buildup of all these other uh, um, molecules that can cause toxicity to cells. So all of these different pathways are possible routes for causing uh, tissue and organ damage. And I'm gonna just move quickly on from this um, because we don't need to know all of the biochemistry in order to be able to help the patients. And we realized that our expertise with this gene and this enzyme put us in a very good position to be able to do just that. And so um, even without knowing all of the causes, we moved ahead to therapeutics. And uh, so addressing the root cause of this disease by either replacing the gene or the enzyme or making the enzyme work better are ways that we are exploring to, to treat and hopefully cure this disease. And the first strategy I'm gonna tell you about is cofactor supplementation. From the time that this enzyme was first described by a, a German scientist in the late 1960s, it was known that this enzyme requires vitamin B6 to work. Vitamin B6, the, the active form of vitamin B6 is called pyridoxal phosphate. And uh, you can see from these uh, very simple enzyme studies that when you add vitamin B6 to the extracts, the enzyme works better. But if you add deoxypyridoxine, which is an inhibitor of vitamin B6 activity, you can see that we suppress the enzyme activity. So this is a B6 dependent enzyme. And we also know that of the many different mutations that children with SPLIS have, if both copies of their gene are mutated in regions, affecting regions of the um, lyase protein uh, that involve vitamin B6 binding in the, in the very conserved B6 binding domain of the protein, that they have a much higher risk of lethality. Their outcome is poor. And that just reflects the importance of vitamin B6 to the activity of the enzyme. Now, why do these mutations cause inactivation of the enzyme? There are probably many reasons, but we looked into the mechanisms in one particular mutation that is, um, accounts for about 30% of SPLIS patients. And this is the R222Q substitution in which a single amino acid is switched out for another. And what we see on the left is that the two subunits of the lyase, um, one shown in green and one shown in yellow, both have a, a, a helix, which is in, uh, colored in orange. And, and that helix binds to the vitamin B6. It coordinates the molecule of vitamin B6. And when we have that single substitution, that helix is displaced. And this leads to a poor binding affinity to B6. So the vitamin can't bind to the, to the enzyme, reducing its activity. On the other hand, on the right, what I'm showing you is a gel of the lyase protein. And you can see that the mutant protein, the R222Q and another mutation S346I, both are 
um, much at much lower levels in cells, meaning that when we express them, they are unstable and the cell recognizes them as probably being misfolded and the cell clears them away. So there's not enough protein to do the work that it needs to do. Now, uh, vitamin B6 is required for over 160 reactions, biochemical reactions in the human body. And not surprisingly, there are many rare diseases in which vitamin B6 dependent enzymes are affected. And it's known that some patients with vitamin B6 dependent enzyme deficiencies respond to treatment with high dose vitamin B6. And that can occur for two different reasons. One is that if uh, a mutant enzyme, a variant of a protein that needs vitamin B6 doesn't bind it very well, like our R222Q mutation, if you give the patient enough vitamin B6 and all of their cells are replete with vitamin B6, then every which way that mutant enzyme turns, it's gonna run into a vitamin B6 molecule. And so even if it doesn't bind very well, it will find its way to its cofactor and work better. The other way that vitamin B6 works is that it can function as a chaperone. When, when proteins are synthesized, they come out as a straight chain of polypeptide uh, amino acid chain, and then it has to fold up into the right conformation to work. And mutant proteins often don't fold properly, but vitamin B6 dependent enzymes uh, in the mutant form can be encouraged to find the right conformation and work better when there's a lot of vitamin B6 around. Now there are many different forms of vitamin B6 and the one that's used most commonly in medicine is pyridoxine. So we employed pyridoxine uh, in a model of SPLIS in, in which we treated uh, skin fibroblasts derived from children with SPLIS uh, with, with different amounts of pyridoxine. And on the left side, the first graph I'm showing you is what happens when we treat cells with vitamin B6. We can see that the S1P level, the substrate of the enzyme is very high in the black bar in cells that have, are, they're grown in media with very little B6. But if you start adding pyridoxine at higher and higher doses, the S1P disappears. And that's because the enzyme starts working better. Um, when we uh, use different versions of vitamin B6, the different uh, isoforms of vitamin, not isoforms, but uh, different vitamins of B6, you can see that they all work to very varying degrees as well in the middle graph. And on the right, I'm showing you just the, the actual enzyme activity in the cells is improved. So that's the goal is to improve the enzyme activity. Um, now that's great and encouraging, but we don't wanna cure fibroblasts. We actually wanna cure patients. And so we decided to then treat patients with SPLIS um, with vitamin B6. And this is an example of the um, blood lymphocyte counts from a patient that responded to vitamin B6. The ALC is the absolute lymphocyte count, and that's a measure of the circulating lymphocytes. And when the lias isn't working, the lymphocytes are trapped in the lymph nodes and the absolute lymphocyte count is abnormally low, less than one. But when we treated this patient with vitamin B6, you can see that those levels rose. And when we looked at the T cell subsets, which is the type of lymphocytes that are affected in this disorder, we saw they also came up very nicely after B6 treatment. In another patient treated with vitamin B6, we also monitored the plasma S1P levels, the substrate of the enzyme that builds up in the blood uh, and in the tissues when the enzyme isn't working. And you can see um, that the plasma S1P levels in the proband in the patient are, are about twice as high as the controls. And that after treatment, um, these levels came down. The pretreatment levels are shown in the blue dots and the graph to the right, and the black dots are after treatment. So this was also very encouraging that two biomarkers of the disease uh, improved with vitamin B6 treatment, but again, we don't wanna just cure biomarkers. We wanna actually make the patients feel better and, and, and have their organs work better. And very recently in the last few months, um, we have had a couple of stories that have been extremely encouraging. And uh, you will hear more about this from Dr. Edisham Khalid, whose presentation will follow mine, but I'm just giving you a, a teaser here that um, this is a patient uh, who 
uh, is a young lady who had a very severe peripheral neuropathy um, and uh, she was treated with vitamin B6. And these are nerve conduction studies uh, demonstrating that the function of her nerves improved after treatment as shown by the increased amplitude, the depth of the signal, um, be both before and after uh, treatment. You can see the increase in the depth of that signal, which is an indication of nerve health. This is very exciting uh, for us and for the patient whom you will also hear from later. Um, and we also know now that we have one patient um, with a very severe kidney disease whose uh, disease was um, improved markedly with treatment. And we're very optimistic that if we can intervene early enough um, that we may be able to um, treat many of these patients with vitamin B6. However, not all patients are gonna respond to vitamin B6. You need to have the lyase protein produced in a mutant form for it to even respond. And many of these patients with splits don't even make the lyase protein at all. And for that, and for those individuals and to create a universal treatment, we are embarking on a treat development of gene therapy. And in particular, we're using adeno-associated virus, which you heard about earlier from Dr. Irv. Um, this is probably the most uh, promising vector that is being used to deliver healthy genes to children with rare diseases. And we have used two different vectors uh, in which the human lyase gene is driven by either the CMV promoter or a synthetic promoter called CAG. Now we have um, tested our theory uh, by delivering a human lyase gene, the SGPL1 gene to the lyase knockout mice. And as I mentioned earlier, these mice uh, are very sick. They only live about three weeks. So we have to intervene very early. The mice uh, are born at normal rates and they look relatively indistinguishable from their litter mates when they're first born, but they, over the first two weeks of life, they start accumulating sphingolipids and they become runted and they die within three weeks. Um, and part of the reason for that, or probably the main reason, is that they have a very similar kidney disorder uh, as the individuals with spliss. Uh, and this is a protein spilling nephropathy, and it can be measured by the urine albumin creatinine ratio or ACR. And you can see that the knockout um, has a very extraordinarily high ACR compared to a wild type mouse. And this leads to the loss of many proteins in the blood, including the serum albumin, which falls and, and begins to cause uh, edema and other problems. And the reason why these kidneys aren't working um, is that the glomerulus of the kidney, which is a little blood vessel tuft, that is the, really what's responsible in the cortex of the kidney for filtering the blood. And there are thousands of these in our kidneys. Um, the court, the uh, glomerulus becomes scarred uh, with scar tissue, with collagen tissue. And so unlike the wild type glomerulus, which is very, uh, very small and, and compact, the, the knockout of glomerulus is enlarged and abnormal and filled with scar tissue. So the way we conducted our initial experiments was to treat newborn mice uh, that have this disease with a single dose of um, AEV SPL which is our gene therapy. We cross heterozygous mice because the knockout mice don't live long enough to survive and mate. So we have to use heterozygous mice. We cross them together. We genotype them on the very first day of life. And when we identify the knockout that has both copies affected and, and has no lyase activity, um, my staff, um, which is, it's still kind of amazing to me how they do this, but they are able to see in these little mice on the first days of life, they, they don't have any hair and you can see their little facial vein um, and they, they inject 20 microliters of uh, virus solution with a little bit of green food coloring uh, so that when they cannulate the vessel properly and, the, and the, uh, the drug goes systemically, the whole mice turn green uh, and then they, they pee it out in 24 hours, the dye doesn't hurt them. And so um, we have uh, done an initial study uh, with 10 mice, um, we either euthanize the mice and, and do various studies on them, or we wait and watch to see what happens. And this is the most important part of my talk um, because it shows you 
uh, that our very first study uh, gave us a, a quite promising result. Um, the knockout mice that are not treated are shown in the red line, and you can see they only live about three weeks. But if we treat those mice uh, in the first days of life with a human gene, which is about 85% similar to the mouse gene and should work very well, we can see that the survival is markedly extended almost to a year. Not in all mice, and there's work to be done to make this more effective, but um, this is showing us a, a quite prominent uh, effect. And in contrast, if we introduce instead a virus carrying a lyase gene that is mutated and has no catalytic activity, as shown by the black line, um, there is no improvement. So this is quite promising. And with catalyst funds, we have now uh, recapitulated this study uh, doing a dose response. And our most recent findings um, are shown here. And I'm gonna just give you a little snippet of, of uh, a view of um, both a wild type mouse and a lies knockout mouse that was treated with gene therapy on day of life one. And basically these mice are indistinguishable. They're almost the same size and they're quite healthy. And these are nine months old at this time and still growing. So we're very excited about that. Um, not only do the mice survive, but they are protected from uh, development of kidney disease. And you can see that the albumin creatinine ratio in these mice um, are uh, normalized. Their serum albumin is normalized and the tuft area, which is an indication of the size of the glomerulus and its defect um, are also improved. Now the knockout mice didn't, uh, were not known to have any neurological defects. Um, they only lived three weeks. They didn't have seizures or anything else that was quite you know, obvious, um, but we decided to perform a battery of uh, tests uh, assessing the day at which these mice acquired a nor normal neurodevelopmental milestones. And you can see that uh, the days at which these mice open their eyes, uh, can hear, um, can figure out how to uh, position themselves better when they're put on a cliff, um, their walking pattern, all of these things are abnormal in the knockout mouse and are corrected uh, by gene therapy or prevented from delay. Uh, with gene therapy and the grip strength also an indication of their motor function is improved markedly with treatment. Their uh, metabolism of sphingolipids goes hand in hand with the outcome. Uh, we can see that the sphingolipids in these mouse tissues, the knockout, untreated knockout are very, very high, hundreds of fold higher than a normal mouse and that these have been markedly improved, the, the restoration of sphingolipid metabolism has been achieved uh, with our gene therapy. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about all the other features that we see that are abnormal in the knockout mouse that are um, corrected by gene therapy, but um, there are many, many um, uh, inflammatory and other markers that uh, are also improved by our treatment. And we're very, very excited to be taking this forward now with um, a, a new grant from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine that is gonna help us uh, develop um, hopefully more effective uh, and safer uh, ways to achieve a more consistent result. Um, I will mention that um, we are developing biomarkers because this is a disease that has variable uh, presentations and in order to be able to uh, make a uniform outcome, uh, in clinical trials, biomarkers, as Dr. Irv mentioned, um, are extremely important. And we are exploring and validating um, plasma sphingolipids, um, of which there are many species as shown on the left. We use uh, mass spectrometry to measure these in the plasma of the patients. Um, and um, we are also uh, characterizing the peripheral blood lymphocytes. Um, and I'm hoping that we will have a, um, an NCATS uh, funded uh, study on this um, in, in the coming days. Uh, and lastly, I just want to mention that um, our work is, is part of a, a complex machine that is focused on cure, um, that academic science um, must work together with patients and families and industry. Um, it, it's a very big uh, process, and um, you heard a little bit about that, and we'll hear more about this uh, later today. 
Um, these are not strictly separate and there are many areas of overlap in which communication uh, and working together is, is absolutely critical. Uh, we have a new patient registry for SPLIS and we are designing a natural history study now. So if you know of any patients with SPLIS, please let me know. And I just wanna end with um, this poem. Uh, this is written by um, my own um, poetry teacher uh, and I'm just gonna read it. This is my praise, this is my proclamation. This is the apple I place on the white plate before you. This is my metaphysics of possibility. And this poem, I think, um, shares the kind of joy and optimism that I and hopefully many of you feel um, being as we are in this genomic era uh, in which we can finally uh, understand at the molecular and genetic level uh, the causes of many of these rare diseases and, and um, be able to be in a position to develop personalized treatments for children, whether they have sickle cell disease or spliss or, um, or cancer. Uh, and I think that um, this is very befitting of the fact that, um, that we're dealing with children, uh, whether they're healthy children or whether they're children facing difficult uh, life altering uh, diseases, all children, um, all children are utterly unique and, and beautiful and rare creations of nature. And with that, I would just thank the people in my lab who uh, conducted this work and uh, the funders that I've listed here. And I'm going to stop sharing my slide. And now I'm going to, um, with great pleasure, introduce my colleague, Dr. Edisham Khalid. Uh, Dr. Khalid is um, the neuromuscular section chair in the Pakistan Society of Neurology. He is the consultant neurophysician at Ideal Medicare in Multan, Pakistan, and he uh, uh, identified um, the cause of uh, a patient's neuropathy that he will tell you about now. Dr. Khalid, you can take over. <laughs> 